Thank you, Brian. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them to the book of Isaiah, 41st chapter. In just a moment, we're going to read verse 10. On Sunday morning, we're in a sermon series called Promises. We're learning that what God says is what God does. What God does is based on what God has said. Today we're looking at the Lord's promise of His presence. His presence in a particular situation that many of us live in, many of us are going through. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. The prophet Isaiah speaking to those of his day, speaking to us of our day. He says, fear not, speaking on behalf of the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Fear not. Be not dismayed. According to prominent psychologists, psychiatrists, the number one issue facing most people today is a struggle with fear. That shouldn't surprise us because the Lord Jesus foretold in the very last days of history that fears would be so intense in people that those fears would actually trigger a heart attack in those people or cause them to drop dead straight from the fear and the physical effects it has on your body. The Bible says people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. As we see what's going on in our world personally, as we see what's going on in our world corporately, we're afraid. Fear is a pandemic that's sweeping across the globe. It was evident in Jesus' day, Isaiah's day, but even more in the final days of history. Fear. Psychologists and psychiatrists who talk to us about fear tell us that there's over 700 fears or phobias you can have and more being added each and every day. Think about it. Some people have a fear of high places. If we were to put you on the roof of this building, you'd have a heart attack. Other people have a fear of low places. If we dropped you in a well, you would have a heart attack. Some people have a fear of life, living. Other people have a fear of dying, death. Some people have a fear of being in a crowd. Other people have a fear of being left alone. Some people have a fear of being in closed places. Other people have a fear of being in open places. Some people have a fear of sickness. Some people have a fear of being in the dark. They have to have a light on. Some people have a fear of being in the light. They like the darkness. And there's a recent fear that's just occurred over the last few years. Many people have a fear of work. Fear. My favorite fear is we actually have people who are afraid of fear. Their fear is fear. What a way to live. To live consumed with fear. To be a prisoner to fear. To be a captive to fear. Jesus said, I've come to set you free. I'm your Lord. Nothing else is your Lord. And yet many of us have made fear our Lord. We tremble at it. 
It controls the way we think, the way we feel, the way we talk, the way we act. It controls where we go. It controls what we do. It controls our relationship with God. It controls our relationship with others. Fear. Fear. And yet God says, fear not. Do not be dismayed, he says. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, we're given two commands and five promises. These promises specifically speak to the subject of fear. But they also could speak to other things. But specifically, in context, to the subject of fear. Notice with me the two commands. We've already mentioned them. We are commanded to fear not. We're commanded, be not dismayed. That's what we're commanded to do. Those are commands. Why? Because of the five promises that God gives us that allows us to overcome the fear, overcome being dismayed. What are the promises? I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will help you. Those are the promises of the verse. Those are the promises. Now, before we go to the promises, I want to make this a very personal message to you, a very specific message to you, a very relevant message to you. So I want you to answer this question, but you don't have to answer it out loud. What's your fear? What is your fear? You don't need to tell me or tell anybody else, but I would dare say three out of every four people sitting here right now looking at me have a fear, some type of fear that dwells in your mind and in your heart, affects the way you live now, and could have an effect on how you will live in eternity. A fear. Maybe your fear as you look at me right now is a financial concern. You have a fear for your finances. Do I make enough money to take care of my obligations and needs? Do I have enough money put away for my future so I can retire and be able to stay financially above water? Financial concerns. Fear. How about family matters? Do you have a fear about your family matters? A fear about your relationship with your spouse? Your children, your grandchildren, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your aunt, your uncle, your nieces, your nephews. Do you have a fear about all of that? Do you have a fear about medical issues? Cancer runs in my family. Should I, I have a concern about it. I have a, a, a care about it. Heart disease runs in my family. Parkinson's runs in my family. Dementia runs in my family. Are you sitting here saying or thinking to yourself, I'm afraid about my health? I'm afraid about my past. Oh, I know God's forgiven me of my past, but I'm afraid somebody might know something. They might tell somebody. It might be revealed how humiliating it would be, how embarrassing it would be, how shameful it would be. And you live in fear that somebody's going to say something. Do you live in fear of the devil? Do you live in fear of a sin or a particular shortcoming in your life spiritually? Maybe you have a fear of a person at school or at work. Every time you see him, you tremble on the inside. What's your fear? 
You see, you can't overcome anything till you acknowledge you have it. And then you can apply God's remedy to that fear by using His promises. So let's look at God's promises real quick. How can we handle our fear, singular, our fears, plural? How can I have victory over them? How can I walk by faith, not by fear? How can I be set free in Jesus? Notice, first of all, it begins by understanding the Lord is with me. I will live without fear because the Lord has promised to be with me. Now, that's not my opinion. That's not a theory. That's not a guess, even an educated guess. That's what he says. Fear not. Be not dismayed. Promise number one, for I am with you. I am with you. You see that? I am is the name that God gives to himself. God doesn't leave it to us to name him. He tells us who his name is because his name is a characteristic of who he is. And it's interesting that God identifies himself to Isaiah as I am. I am is a present tense declaration by God. God is not a God of the past. He's not a I was. He's not a God of the future, not I will be. God doesn't have a past. He doesn't have a future. He's the God of the eternal present. And He always will be. I am that I am God in the moment, right here, right now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, now, today. And because I am a God of the present, I'm with you today, right now, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through. I am the true, the living, the only triune God of creation and redemption. I'm all wise, I'm all powerful, I'm omniscient, I'm omnipotent, and I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, when we grasp that the presence of God with us can dispel fear, we will not have fear. 23rd Psalm, verse 4, David talking about and making an allusion to fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. Why will David not fear? Because the Lord is with him. David said, even when death comes, death will be nothing but a shadow. Shadows can scare us, but they can't hurt us. David said, when I die, to be absent from the body will be present with the Lord. My Lord will be with me. He'll take me through the threshold from this life to the life to come. He'll be with me. He won't send an angel. He will be with me. The presence of God is a promise that we have today, tomorrow, and forever. He will be with us. When we have the fear, He will be with us. When we face the fears, He will be with us. When we conquer the fears, He will be with us. When I was about six or seven years old, we lived in a trailer park. Dad was in the military. We moved frequently, so we had a little small trailer. And we would live in trailer park communities. And in this particular trailer park, I was about six or seven years old, elementary school, first or second grade. Well, there was a, a bully in the, in the trailer park, in the mobile home park. He was a middle school boy. He was twice my size and twice my weight, and his muscles were twice my muscles. 
And he was just a mean kid. I, I can't tell you, he's just mean. And every time I would leave my little yard, we had a little fence around it, every time I would leave it, he would always find a way to, to pick on me. Sometimes he'd call me names. Sometimes he would push on me. Occasionally he would hit me. Sometimes he would kick me. He had threatened me, take from me if I had something he wanted. I mean, he was just a bully. And I would tell mom, and mom was a sweet mother. She really was, but she was passive. And mom's solution to the bully was, well, if you just stay in the front yard, he won't bother you. But mom, I, I want to walk the neighborhood. I want to ride my bike. I want to go to the washroom across the street. They had a washroom and she said, well, if you just stay in the yard, he won't bother you. Well, okay. I was never happy with that, and sometimes I'd slip out, and he'd, it, it would occur again. He'd pick on me. Well, Dad came home. My dad wasn't a passive man, and that wasn't a solution to him. And him and Mom had conversations. She said, just keep him in the front yard. No, he don't have to stay in the front yard. And so dad's solution was to get a baseball bat, <laughs> Louisville Slugger. Dad said, this is what you do. He rides by this, our house, your, tra you know, your house all the time on the road. He sneers at you, calls you names, dares you to come out. Next time he comes by on that bicycle, you come out fast as you can run. Take that ball bat and knock the daylights out of him. Don't say nothing. Just hit him as hard as you can. I like that. <laughs> and so up until the time that it had to happen, I was all for it. But here he came. And dad was off to the side. And he's saying, And I ran out with that bat, got there, and I went, pow! I knocked that bully off his bike. I hit him in the leg. Then I hit him again in the stomach, shoulder area. He's crying out there. And I'm looking at him. And then I'm thinking to myself, I was overcome. He might get up. He gets up, he's going to be mad. <laughs> and if he gets up and he's mad, he's going to kill me. And then I looked around. And there was my dad. My dad, strong, firm, military type man. And he said, you don't be afraid, I'm here. You see, that's the way the Lord is. Not necessarily with the bat, but he gives us a bat. <laughs> and he says, go whack on that fear. And once you whack on that fear and knock it off its bicycle and show it you're not going to be intimidated no more, you're not going to be bullied by it anymore, you're not going to be threatened by it anymore, as soon as you do that, I want you to know, I got you back. I got you back, I'm with you. Dad's presence meant everything to me. And the Lord's presence should mean everything to us as we look at fears. He's with you. Do you know that? Look up here. He's with you. Secondly, I will not live in fear. Because of the second promise that's given. Look at your Bible. For I am your God. I will not be dismayed. For he is my God. You know what that word dismayed means? It means to have a fear that is terrifying. It's not just a fear of the dark. That's fear. It's a fear that somebody is hiding in that darkness that's going to hit you in the head, rape you, or murder you. That's, that's what 
The word means dismayed. It means a terrifying fear. Not just a fear of being in a crowd, that's a fear, but a fear that that crowd is going to close in on you and crush the living daylights out of you. It's an intensified fear. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be terrified, for I am your God. Can I ask you a question? How big is your God? How strong is your God? How loving is your God? Because your knowledge of God and your understanding of God has a lot to do with how you handle your fears. When Moses was at the Red Sea, and there was no place to go on the left or right. And the mightiest army in the world of that day was right behind him. Moses had no army. They were just slaves. No weaponry. Nothing. And Pharaoh was coming with the mightiest army in the world to wipe out the Israelites and take the rest of them back to Egypt. Moses looked down and saw his God. No. His God wasn't a pygmy. His God was a giant. And Moses looked to the sky. He wasn't afraid because his God was big. And David's God was strong. All people could see was how big Goliath the human tank was. Yet David looked beyond Goliath. And David saw how strong his God was. Noah, he knew the judgment was coming and it was going to come with water. But he knew his God loved him. He knew his God cared for him. He knew that his God said, you build this ark and you get inside, I'll close the door and you will be safe. You might fall down inside the ark, but you're not falling out. You see, the ability to look at life through the lens of faith comes back to how you see God. And I believe in many Christian people's lives, you look at God as some little pygmy who can't handle the Red Sea. God is some 90-pound wink link that Satan comes around and kicks sand in his face. That he can't handle what you're facing. Or God doesn't care. God just is a remote, he's out in the distance, he's doing his own thing, he doesn't care about you. But in the case of Moses, in the case of David, in the case of Noah, they saw God differently. And that gave them the faith to understand that though we might be facing things that are fearful, we're not going to be afraid. God will do what He said He's going to do. To know God is to love God. To love God is to trust God. To trust God is to obey God. And to obey God is not to have any fear. It all begins by knowing who God is. And the only way you're going to know who God is, is study your, your Bible. Your Bible is a book of revelation. It tells us who God is according to God. And most people who battle with fear, they have a very poor concept of God. Promise number three. I will live without fear because he is with me. I will live without fear because this one who is with me is God Almighty. I will live without fear because he will strengthen me. Do you see that? I will strengthen you, he says. The context is I will strengthen you when you face your fears. You do not have to be weak. I will give you strength. There's two things that happen when the Lord saves us. First of all, he changes us. He makes us like himself. Okay? 
The second thing he does or wants to do is exchange us. Exchange us. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, you know this verse, it says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You know what that word renew means? It means to trade in something that is inferior and receive something that's superior. So what the Lord does when we are facing our fears, we face our fears with foolishness. He says, wait a minute. Give me your foolishness and I'm going to give you my wisdom. We face our fears with impotence. He says, give to me your impotence. I'm going to give to you my power. You see, the exchange life is where the victory is won. The change life makes us like Jesus. The exchange life gives us victory. We bring our inferior things to him and say, Lord, I can't face this fear with what I've got. I don't have anything. He says, I know you don't have anything. Give what you got to me and I'm going to exchange it, give you something far better. The exchange life. He says, those who want to be strengthened, I will give you my strength. I'll take your weakness, give you my strength. That's a pretty good trade, isn't it? I'll take your impossibility and give you my possibility. I'll take your can't and give you my can. I'll take your fear and give you a faith that sees me as a big God, a strong God, a loving God, a God who is able. Fourthly, I will live without fear because of promise number one, he's with me. Promise number two, he's my God. Promise number three, he will strengthen me. He will give me his strength and take my weakness. Promise number four, he will help me. You see there, I will help you. Hebrews 13, 6 says, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear because the Lord is my helper. The Lord who is with us is never going to abandon us, refuse us, or walk away from us. He was there for Noah. He stayed with Noah till it was over. He'll stay with us. He stayed with Joshua. He stayed with Moses. He stayed with David. You say, but pastor, they're heroes. I'm just an ordinary, insignificant person. You're a child of God if you're saved. There's no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. There's no stepchildren in the kingdom of God. There's no favorites in the kingdom of God. We're all children of God. He treats us all equally, uniquely, differently, but equally. And he'll help us. He was there. For Noah. He was there for Moses. He was there for Joshua. He was there for David. Look up here at me. He'll be there for you. Mike Speck has a beautiful song, Keith, where he says basically that. He talks about how the Lord is with all of the great men and women of faith in the Bible, but he's also with us. You're just as valuable to God just as valuable to God as Ruth and Esther and Mary and Martha. You're just as valuable to God as Noah or Moses or Joshua or David. Never look down on yourself. If you're a lady here today, you're a princess. If you're a man here today, you're a prince. Because your father is royalty. People think it's a big do to be British royalty. We're biblical royalty. Amen. Much bigger a do. And then lastly, notice the last promise. These are promises to God for those who battle with fear. We can overcome it. You don't need a pill. You don't need counseling. Neither will hurt, maybe, but you really don't need that. You just need to apply the promises. God says, I'm with you in your fears. 
I'm your God in your fears. I will strengthen you in your fears. I will help you in your fears. And then he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand in your fears. You know what the, that, that word uphold means? It's, it's a construction word. It's actually speaking of the foundation that God puts up under his people. I've said many times, I'll say it again. You can put a 10 cent building on a million dollar foundation, it'll last forever. But if you put a million dollar building on a 10 cent foundation, it won't last a year. That's why Jesus had a lot to say about foundations. How we build our life and what we build our life on because it will determine how we handle the storms and how we handle the fears and all the other things of life that will come against us. David said in Psalm 145, the Lord upholds. He puts a foundation under all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is our foundation, is what he's saying. Fear says, I'm going to knock you over, I'm going to blow you away. And God says, no, it ain't going to happen. Let fear huff and puff. <laughs> but it's not going to blow your house down. If your house is built on my foundation, your house will stand against any fear, all fears, forever. Amen. 365 times somebody said, the Bible says, do not fear in some way, shape, or form. You know, that's one for every day of the year, isn't it? You say, woe is me, what am I going to do tomorrow? Do not fear. What am I going to do next week? Do not fear. God has like a broken record. He just gives you the same thing. Do not fear. Because I've made promises to you and I will fulfill my promises, each and every one of them. I hope when we get to heaven, they'll have a movie theater there. Maybe they'll have the big eight, super eight, or whatever they call them things. Cinemark. And we get your ticket. Already paid for, by the way. Just get your ticket. Get your big soda. Get your popcorn. Go in and watch the Bible story. Except we're not going to see actors. We're not going to see Hollywood. We're going to look back into time and see the very stories of the Bible lived out before our very eyes, just as if we're there. Wow. We're going to see Noah with his hammer <laughs> building the ark. We're going to see Moses with his staff parting the Red Sea. We're going to see David with his slingshot bring down Goliath. We're going to see Joshua with the marching band Bring down the walls of Jericho. And we're going to see there was some fear in all four of those people. But the fear did not conquer them. They conquered the fear because they saw something that nobody else could see when they did their mighty exploit for God. What did Noah see? Besides a hammer in his hand and some nails, he saw a God who said, you're going to make it. I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to bring judgment against the world. But Noah, you and your family are going to make it. That's what Noah saw. You know what Moses saw? Nobody else saw it. He saw the promise of God that said, I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey. Now think with me. If that's what God said, then this was a rigged battle, was it not? There's no way Pharaoh was going to haul the Israelites back to Egypt. There's no way he was going to slaughter them at the Red Sea. Because God would have been a what? A liar. God told David, you're going to be the next king of Israel. There's no way Goliath could have killed David. There's no way. I submit to you, David could have laid on his back 
and threw a rock up in the air with his hand. And God would have taken that rock, turned it in midair, and struck the giant. Joshua knew that the walls were going to come down. God told him so. So as they marched around singing Amazing Grace, he knew what was going to happen. I close by telling you this. Don't always see the visible. Look for the invisible and remember God keeps his word. I've got a fear, Pastor. Remember, God is with you. I've got a fear, Pastor. Remember, He is with you and He is God. Remember, He will strengthen you. He will help you. He will put a foundation under you that will not bend, will not bow, will not break. A foundation that will hold you up in the mightiest of storms, will hold you up in the mightiest of fears. And God said, you're going to make it. Don't let no fear buffalo you. Don't let no fear push you aside. You're going to get through it. You're going to get through it. Because he said you would. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.